So uh, we're going to be um, reflecting on a passage from Romans, Romans 13. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Take this all the more seriously because you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. When I was in uh, junior high, I got a 10-speed bicycle for the first time. Brand new bike, sleek, clean, fast as lightning, I thought. And as soon as I got it, I rode it to school. I was very impressed with my speed and skill on this thing. I assumed anyone that saw me was thinking the same thing. And as I rode it home that, that first day, I think, I remember pedaling, pedaling like mad. And in awe at my own speed, I looked down, straight down, at the pavement that was rushing past me. I was mesmerized. I was flying right into the back of a parked van. I had become so fascinated with that tiny little patch of pavement, pavement that was moving past me, that one small slice of reality that I completely ignored where I was headed. I crushed my front wheel. I think maybe I broke the bike. I can't remember. I just remember limping and dragging the mangled bike the rest of the way home. The, uh, the relevance of that story, I think, will become clear in a minute. Uh, this, this passage from Romans is usually divided in half. We read the first paragraph, or the second one, but not both. But when we do that, we're missing Paul's central point. What he says in this second paragraph about putting on the armor of light, living as if the day of the Lord has already arrived, living in that day. That's not just another way, that's, that's just another way of fleshing out what he said in the previous verses about the debt of love that we owe to each other. There's a little phrase in the middle, a little two-word Greek phrase. The NRSV translates it as, besides this, you know what time it is. That is a terrible translation. The, the NIV says, and do this understanding the present time. In other words, love each other, understanding the present time. Um, another translation says, and take this all the more seriously, knowing what time it is. That, I think, captures what Paul is getting at here. What he's saying about who we are now and who we're ultimately called to be in union with Christ forever. For Paul, these are two sides of the same coin inseparable from each other. 
In other words, eternity and the present are connected to each other. We're called to let our ultimate end reshape who we are and how we live and how we love now. But there are different ways of thinking about this. One way is what you might call eternity as a threat. You know, you're driving peacefully, enjoying the, the cold weather here, and suddenly you encounter this billboard, this menacing, threatening billboard. Um, this way of, of thinking about our ultimate end is, is framed primarily as a threat to make us afraid. You could meet your maker at any moment, and if you don't shape up, then you're going to be shipped out permanently. You're going to get the trap door. Um, this way of thinking of our end makes it uh, like a stopping point. It, it also divorces our present time, our present lives, from our eternal life. We live our lives, and then after our lives are over and completed, then we have this end, this day that Paul mentions. <clears throat> that day is entirely isolated, cut off from who we are and when we are now in the present moment. And this, for a lot of us, has become our way of thinking about our ultimate end, about this day that Paul's referring to here. But this sort of thing wouldn't really make much sense to Paul. It certainly is not what he's talking about in Romans 13. Nor is it really the primary way that the New Testament as a whole talks about eternity. When Jesus talks about eternal life, he says, this is eternal life, knowing God. He's offering hope to the hopeless and the oppressed. So what is Paul saying when he talks about our ultimate purpose, our ultimate end? Well, he's not talking about our end as in a stopping point. He's not talking about it as something separate and cut off and subsequent to who and what we are now like the way that a football game ends after the timer runs out. Paul's talking about our end as a goal, as a purpose, as a culminating point towards which we're called to move. Our final and eternal rest in God's own eternal life. I'd like to offer a metaphor for this, a comparison. Stay with me. A few years ago, I was studying Buddhism for um, one of my classes at SMU. And I saw that there are monks who spend days or weeks putting together these incredibly complex, stunning 2D sculptures called sand mandalas. They're constructed slowly, meticulously, by a process of placing individual grains of sand in particular places on a flat surface like a table. There are videos you can watch where you can see the whole thing come together in just a few minutes. And as you watch these beautiful sculptures come together, grain by grain, you see a pattern begin to form. It takes time. And it takes thousands and thousands of grains of this colored sand. But as they keep doing this work, a beautiful arrangement, an image, begins to materialize before your eyes. You begin to see patterns of bright colors emerging progressively until they're all arranged in this set of interwoven patterns. It's amazing. Now, I want to suggest to you, not that Paul is a Buddhist, and in fact, Buddhist thinking about these things is very different from the way that, that Paul thinks, but rather that Paul's understanding of our end is comparable, is analogous to the formation of these sorts of sculptures. 
For Paul, our end is not a stopping point. It's not something that comes after our present lives, something detached from who and what and when we are now. Instead, it's something we participate in now. Our end is like the final image, the ultimate form or arrangement of all things coming together. But that final end, that final formation, is not something separate and subsequent to who we are now. It's something we participate in. That final image is there, and it's visible in the placing of each grain. It's just not completely clear or completely visible yet. That final end, that final formation, is not something that is separate or subsequent from the process by which it comes together. The kingdom of heaven is here among you, Jesus says over and over and over again. Live now as if in the day, Paul says. That end, in other words, that day is every day. That day is yesterday and today and tomorrow. As the love of God slowly reshapes our minds and our mouths, and our ears, and our eyes, and our hearts, transforming us more and more into the image of Christ, to be agents of reconciliation as God reconciles with us, to be merciful as God is merciful, to love as God loves. That final end is present now. It's an image emerging in the present, an image being formed in us now as the body of Christ, grain by grain throughout our lives. And that end is not a threat. It's a covenant with God who is constantly at work, constantly present, and constantly calling us to give over our whole selves to this transformation, to let the image of Christ emerge in the present, in every nook and cranny and corner of our lives. And so it makes sense for Paul to say that given their, their participation in that final day now, that we should love in ways that reflect that eternal life with God, the God who is reworking who we are in the present. Let me put it a, a different way. In my Christian heritage class, we've just finished talking about what's called the Constantinian shift. In the early 4th century, around 303, an emperor named Diocletian, he was the emperor in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, he was attempting to discern whether or not he should enter into a certain conflict. And he asked his pagan priests to study an omen. I think it was goat entrails. And they huddled around the goat innards, and they studied and talked, but the answer was not clear to them. They couldn't read the omen and advise the emperor on what course to take. And the reason for this, they concluded, was, was that there were Christians around the empire who were failing to show support and compliance and faith in these sorts of rituals. So they informed Emperor Diocletian that it was the Christians' lack of proper faith that was to blame for the failed omen. And so Diocletian uses this as a justification for a surge in persecution against the Christians. Persecution of the most brutal variety, apparently. A couple of years pass by, he and the emperor in the West abdicate their positions, and the leaders who are left are named Constantius and Galerius. Constantius, who's been gathering forces and support up in Britain, dies in 305. And his troops favor his son Constantine as his successor. These people apparently had no concern that 1,700 years later, a bunch of students would be trying to memorize their confusing names. <laughs> But to make a long story even longer, um, Constantine then presides over one of the most 
pivotal moments in Western history. He goes to battle with the son of Maximian, a guy named Maxentius, who has tried to take and control Italy. But according to legend, just before the battle, Constantine has a vision showing a, a Christian symbol, the first two letters of Christ's name, Cairo, and he hears a voice from the heavens saying, under this sign, conquer. And so he does. He puts the sign, it's called a labarum, on his soldiers' shields, and he proceeds to defeat Maxentius, taking control of the western half of the empire, and then moving on to take charge of the whole thing. This is a key turning point, though, for Christians. In 313, the year after that battle, Constantine enters into an agreement with one of the other remaining rulers, an agreement called the Edict of Milan, which brings to an end all persecution of Christians. Christianity is now a legal religion in the Roman Empire. It's not the official religion, and Constantine wasn't really fully committed to Christianity until uh, he, he was baptized on his deathbed. He continued to officiate in the emperor's role in, in various pagan ceremonies. But Christianity was legal now, at least. And so now Christians can meet and worship publicly. They can build church buildings. They don't have to meet in secret anymore, and so on. Christian worship changes as a result. The clothes that the clergy wear change. Christian art changes. And what I want to focus on for a moment today, Christian hope changes. Many Christians, not all, many Christians are inclined to think that this is the fulfillment of all they could hope for in the present life. This is the fulfillment of Christian hope. So when they think of Christian hope, it doesn't really pertain to what we're doing or who we are now. All that's left of it, the only thing Christian hope really refers to now, is what will happen, or rather, where will I go and what will I get after I die? As Justo Gonzalez puts it, Christian hope came to be relegated to the future life, or the distant future. It seemed to have little to do with the present world. Religion tended to become a way to gain access to heaven, rather than to serve God in this life and the next. The earlier notion that in the resurrection of Christ, the new age has dawned, and that by baptism and the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, Christians become participants in it. That was abandoned, and Christian hope was now limited to the individual's life after death. Another way of putting this is that this is the sort of thinking that separates what Paul says in the first few verses that I read about the debt of love that we, do, we owe to each other from what he's saying in verses 11 through 14 about the day approaching, that we should live in that day separating his command for us to owe each other a debt of love from his declaration that the final goal and culmination of all things approaches closer and closer, and that we should live as if in that day, that our final hope is an ongoing force of transformation in the present, an ongoing challenge against the status quo in the present. For Paul, the one flows out of the other. We make sense of what it really means to love each other by taking that broader, eternal view of things, by seeing ourselves and the world around us and our neighbors and our enemies through the lens of that final viewpoint, the drawing together of all things. And so we don't love selfishly. We don't love based on what we might gain from the other person. We don't love based on how we might use the other person. We don't love in ways that are defined merely by the limits of my own perspective, my own prejudices and biases and desires. We love with God's own eternal love, 
as it reshapes our minds and hearts grain by grain into the image of Christ. I want to close with one last passage from Paul. 2 Corinthians 3. He says, And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we praise your holy name. We thank you that you have been merciful and graceful to us. We pray that you would open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear, soften and open and reshape our minds and our hearts that we might know you and know each other as you know us. We pray all things through Christ our Lord. Amen.